One comment about presentation. We just were discussing before the, the lecture starts. Mateus was telling me that in this random walk business, we started with distribution where all moments are finite, and then we saw that they flow to the Gaussian. And if they have some bias, the bias is becoming bigger and bigger as we zoom out, right? Like wind in a room. And we had studied that in the context of generalization, and it was a nice story. And Mateo was pointing out that there are other distributions which don't have all moments finite, that are also fixed points in a way, so they are interesting distributions as well. So I thought it would be nice if you would give us a presentation about these more general random walks with these other distributions that are fixed points. And more generally, throughout the course, I'm sure that we'll be talking about things that some of you might know, oh, I know of this generalization or that. So let's decide that uh, this is something we could and we should do. So in the same way that as Matthias is going to talk about other random law distribution, if you have other ideas for cool things that uh, you would like to study and then present, let's have that as an option. So, so let's, uh, we will design one hour extra, some day of the week, and we will record as well, and it's part of the course, but it's on extra supplementary presentations that are not necessary for the logic, but which are nice appendices that we will be so the first one will be on the on other stable distributions that are stable in the sense that the probability after n steps looks like the probability after one step, like the Gaussian for us. But because they evade some of the assumptions that we started with, namely finite moments and so on, we get more freedom and more possible distributions. And the idea of this presentation would be to try to fit it within this normalization framework that we were discussing. Okay? But just to tell you, this is open. If there's a topic that either you like very much and wanted to study more and then present, or it's a topic that you happen to have seen different aspects of it, like in Matteo's case, tell me, and this is a nice option for us. The second thing is about Fourier, that uh, Ivan was a bit uh, was asking about some integ integration domain in Fourier. So let me recap uh, something about Fourier that we encountered already in these lectures, three different domains in R. So R could be continuous, right? So R could belong to Rd, for example. It could be a finite lattice. So in that case, R could belong, say, to Zd, or Sorry, this is an infinite lattice, like Rd, or it could be a finite lattice. Right? So R is equal to Rx, Ry, and this guy takes values, say, 1 up to L, or minus L over 2, up to L over 2, if we want to make it centered around. And when we are dealing with these three different possibilities, the nature of Fourier transforms are different. In continuous R, we say that we integrate over all possible momenta, we divide by 2 pi to the d, and this goes all over all momenta. So each momenta is over R from minus infinity to plus infinity. And for example, we have this kind of identity e to the i q x is equal to delta function d dimensional delta function of x which is the function that when I integrate the test function gives me f of c right. when I have a finite lattice on the other hand the nature what, ge what the generalizes this is that I sum over my momentum in my virulent zone which is a set of momenta Q, where Qx, Qy, and so on, they take values from minus
And depending if half is odd or even, maybe there's a shift by one half there, but who cares? Right? And all Qs take these values. And when we have this times e to the i q times r, right? so what happens? Well, this sum we can do analytically, right? So this sum here is proportional to 1 minus e to the i qx times l, for example. When I sum up to l, if I sum over q, sorry, sum over q, so I get uh, L terms, I get R times uh, I this way. Rx in one case. Okay. And so this is zero because R is in a lattice. Unless r is 0 from the beginning, and if r is 0 from the beginning, I count how many terms there are here. So this is equal to volume times discrete delta function of r being equal to 0. And finally, here, when r belongs to zd, when the lattice is infinite, then this sum that was discrete sum becomes an integral between minus pi and pi for each of the variables d d q over 2 pi to the d e to the i q r where r is discrete but on an infinite lattice and this is equal to delta of r comma 0 because you see if r is exactly equal to 0 this integral, each d dimension gives 2 pi, cancels this 2 pi to the d, and it gives exactly the, chronicle, the discrete chronic delta. But if r is 1, the integral over q gives 0. You get uh, an integral of the sine and sine and gives 0. Okay? So, and all of them, then, they are all equivalent at large distances, where we don't see the lattice, simply because then Q is small. Right? And so it doesn't really matter if we are integrating between minus pi and pi or between minus to plus infinity because it's the small Q region that dominates anyway, which is the idea that if I zoom out, I don't see the lattice. So the third comment, uh, the final last comments before we move on to new stuff today is about free energy. I want to just point out that we had observed something nice, which was that the free energy of the Gaussian model was equal to the volume of the Gaussian model times the integral over 2 pi to the d, 1 half, this came from some square root, log of q squared plus a m squared plus a constant. And we also saw that the free energy of the random wall where by this we mean what? By this we mean the sum over k to the n times number of closed loops of length n, right? But the way we defined, we said that they could be at any point of the lattice, so we divide it by v, so that it's v independent, right? And we were summing, and whatever we put this on the lattice, it was giving the same. And this was giving the similar expression, right? It was an integral, it was the same. This. And this led to an, the first comparison between the Gaussian model of free energy 
and this gas polymers indicating that there should be a relation between the two models, as we said. But well, let me just make a naive comment that I wanted to fix this, is that we divided by V, right? That was just for something V independent. I think it's a little bit silly to do it, because free energy is not V independent, it's an extensive quantity. So it would be better not to divide by V, and then the V will appear here, with which it did not, but it does appear in the trend, then it's really exactly the same. Free energy is an extensive quantity, the free energy should be proportional to the volume of the system. Of course, what we were computing was not the free energy, was the free energy per unit volume. Okay, so I just want to make a comment that this stuff here, with the 1 over V, was not the free energy, but the free energy per unit volume. So it was the density of free energy what we were computing in knowledge, not the free energy. So once we do it really the free energy, then even volume factors, everything is as it should. And as we said, so we see the first connection to the Gaussian model. The Gaussian model is Gaussian, so we should learn what there is to be learned about Gaussian integrations, which is what I'm going to review now. So there was one person that was starting to take quantum field theory one. What was his name? Well, I'm sorry? Who was, who was the person that was starting to take quantum field theory one? That was uh, uh, I'm a, uh, I remember I'm also taking. Yeah, but the, the other person here was here. He was your colleague, right? Long hair. And... Oh, uh, Cassian. Cassian, yeah. maybe. Yeah. The, the one. Yes, yeah. Okay. So I think he has never seen Gaussian integration, but he's not here. I believe everyone here probably has seen Gaussian integration. Ah, uh, you're not? Okay. Uh, cool. So you will learn some. with a matrix A, dotted with X, with a convenient factor of 1 
where let me be very explicit these things xi, aij, xj with some over repeated in this. And this matrix A we can take it to be symmetric because if it's not symmetric, it's sandwiched between something symmetric, so the anti-symmetric part is projected out. So we can assume this matrix A is symmetric. And let's suppose I want to compute this Gaussian integral plus some source J dot X, where this means J i sum over repeated indices. Okay. So this would be the object where we want to compute. <coughs> and notice that the Gaussian integral we dealt with is a particular case of this. The n there would be the number of lattice points. And x would be the spin at the position of the lattice. Right? Do you agree? So, this is a particular case of what we have seen before, where x within this chain is the analog of s at position i. And the matrix A i j was the analog of our matrix to use this funny A r r prime. It's just a particular case where the label is the position of the lattice. So, what we are doing is more general. And what we did last time, and it includes what we did last time. Okay. So we call this the integral i with source j, and we define it like this. And as we will see, this integral with source j is equal to some interesting factor that we will compute. There will be something here that we will come to times the integral without any source. So let's start by this object. So we'll start here and then we'll see that it is proportional that they are proportional, but let's first compute what would be the result without source. So without source, we have no source and we have to compute this integral. So what would we do? We would say that this matrix A, which is a symmetric matrix, can be diagonalized and can be written as omega times a diagonal matrix A1 up to An times omega minus 1, where this is a rotation matrix that diagonalizes the matrix. To be equal to omega times y, that's a rotation because it's a rotation. The Jacobian of this transformation is one. I'm just rotating my vector. And once I do it, this make this quadratic form becomes just sum over j. Diagonalize this problem, so I have y variable j squared times aj. And this part here becomes just integral over the y variables. So the integral with j equal to zero, this is what is in the exponent. But then uh, it is just a function of y1 plus function of y2 plus function of y3. So this integral just factorizes. Right? And therefore, the integral with j equal to 0 becomes equal to a product of j equal to 1 up to n. Once it is diagonalized, then each integral just appears here, integral dyj e to the minus 1 half y j square aj and that's what I have to multiply this integral we did it last time but let's do it once more so this integral 
is fire scale y by 1 over square root of hj. This integral is 1 over square root of hj, that's the interesting part, times a number, and that number is just the integral dy e to the minus y squared over 2. Okay. And this number is square root of 2 pi, and I mean, I'm sure you have seen it once, but since we are recording, let me explain why. So How do I compute this integral here? I say that this integral is equal to square root of the square of the integral, which I write as the integral dx dy. I just square the integral e to the minus one half x squared plus y squared. Right? This looks like a silly thing, but the nice thing is that now we go to radial coordinates. And we say in radial coordinates, this is just r squared. When I go to radial coordinates. And this, dx dy, becomes just 2 pi r dr after I integrate it over the angle. And now the integral I can do because I have r down here, r squared up there. So this is exactly the integral of that. So once I do the integral over r, I get e to the minus r squared over 2 minus between infinity and 0 infinity gives nothing 0 gives 1 times the 2 pi that's here so that's equal to 2 pi and therefore this is square root of 2 pi over h and therefore this object is square root of 2 pi to the n, that's just a constant, we don't really care, divided by the product over j of the eigenvalue of the matrix A. Now, if you have a matrix, you can diagonalize it, find its eigenvalues and multiply them. That's what we did. We went to Fourier, right? So when we went to Fourier, so another element of this analogy is that the Fourier, the elements, the eigenvalues are nothing but the Fourier elements of A. A, when going to Fourier, diagonalized the problem, so the eigenvalues are the elements in Fourier. And what we did, remember, was exactly multiply the elements with Fourier. Right? Which is exponential of the sum of the log. And because there was a square root, there was this one half that we wrote in the free energy in the very beginning of today. That one half was from the square root, when so I write this as exponential of one half times log of this guy. Clear it? But notice also that this, a more invariant way of writing, if I don't want to generalize the matrix, is to notice that product of eigenvalues. is just the determinant of my matrix A. So that's the result of Gaussian integration. This is the integral when j equal to 0. It's proportional to the determinant square root, square root yeah, of the determinant of the matrix A. Y and the HA appears like this by dimensional analysis. And I did not 
need to know about this integral, it doesn't matter that it's too high, if it was theta free, it would be the same thing. So, so we did it without thinking too much. But we could also have taken this formula and just plugged our matrix A in this formula and gotten the same result that we got last time. Okay, so that's one thing. And now let's see, so what about the integral with J, with source J? How do we do this integral with this source? Well, we risk, we shift x in a way as to absorb this source. So we write that the integral with j is equal to the integral dx exponential. And then I'll do the following. Let's write an identity which is correct. One half, and then I say that I have x minus uh, j a x minus j. Let me show you what I want to do. You see that the term with x times x times a is what I want. It's a uh, a sandwich with x. I want the source. So there, is, there are two terms, j times x, and j times x, that's giving me the source. It appears twice, the twice cancels the one half. But I don't want the a, I want just the source, so I need to put a minus 1 dot this. And here, a minus 1 dot this. Notice, let's be very careful, that uh, when we write like this, strictly speaking, this is a vector. So if I write a precise notation, it's like this, vector, matrix dot vector, vector, matrix dot vector, but if this is a, a column, this is a row, so transpose. We, we never think about this, but okay, yeah. Strictly speaking, it's better to put the transpose here, right? So, we put the transpose. I feel a bit better. So, right? And so when I do when but it's important that this transpose means that a minus one is close to this a, so we can't just when I multiply it also this. Okay. So this, when I open up the parentheses, do I get that? So the term with two x's is okay, the term with one j is okay, but I get a term with two j's that I don't want there. So I need to add it, and the term with two j's is the following plus one half. There are two a minus ones and one a, so I get j a minus one j. Huh? This is the result. Where this again? This means one half j i made the inverse of my matrix element i j j j. Now that is independent of x, so I can write that the integral over j is equal to e to the one half j dot a minus one dot j. Right? I can take it out of the integral times the remaining integral over x. But the remaining integral over x, I can shift it by that quantity, and it's the same as the integral we started with. So it's this times the integral with j equal to z. Just because I can rescale, and this is just x prime, this is just x prime, and this is just a shift, so this is equal to the x prime. And so this integral is nothing but the first integral that we already computed. So we get the first box here and the second box. Let's write everything exclusively. 
sin a j k sin x k minus i minus one k l j l. Right? That's the full thing. So now notice that I think you're asking when I multiply the three. You see that they do come with the right tendency to be multiplication, right? I'm oh, sorry. Here I should not use this. I should use a different letter. M. M. In the middle should be I. And in the middle it should be I. So. So this means that I know how to do not only the Gaussian model, but what does this translate into physics if I have this extra source, for example, in the language of the Gaussian model? I can do not only the Gaussian model, but I can add this j dot x. What would it be for the Gaussian model? Why would I care in that case to adding a source? So remember, so this, in the Gaussian model, this part was spin interaction. Spin dot some neighbors of neighbors dot spin. What would this be? A magnetic field. Right. So this, in the language of this, would be a magnetic field. Right. It would be some H, we would call it H at position R dotted with S. J coupled to each thing. It would be the same, in that case this J would be equal for all components, or it could be independent of the lattice. It could turn out to magnetic. So it would be quite relevant if we would like to study this Gaussian spin model when we have a magnetic. But there is one more use for putting these currents, which is the use that people, the, most, the biggest use in quantum field theory, is that this source is a generating function for correlation functions of my x. Because if I put a source, an arbitrary source, by studying how my partition function reacts to changing a bit the magnetic field, I learn about the spin at that position. And, ma and mathematically that translates into the statement that if I take derivatives with respect to ji, I bring down x's so I can compute averages of x's. Okay? Physically, again, is the statement that if I want to manipulate spin i, I change the magnetic field to position i a little bit. Okay. So, so let's, re let's recap that. We have this entry over j, and we could want to compute expectation value of x i1 x i k in this Gaussian model. There is, we want to compute this average on that Gaussian model, say without magnetic field, with j equal to zero. How would we do it? We would say that I can just do the following. I can take derivatives with respect to j i1 derivative with respect to j i k if I know my partition function with source I take derivatives and then we work on the exponential and bring down x i1 up to x i j so I just act several times on i j and 
after I finish acting, I set j to 0 and I remove the exponential. That gives me this integral where I put here x1 up to xik, right? And I want average of 1 to be 1, so I want to do 1 over i0. So I want to normalize my day integral without source, right? In other words, I want to take derivative. This is in the back of the source, I can put it here. So what I want is exactly derivative of the ratio ij over ij. Right? In other words, what we want are derivative with respect to j1, ji1, derivative with respect to jik, uh, precisely that expression here. Precisely this nice exponential that we computed. So that's really the interesting part, not the determinant so much for average, but this of e to the one half j a minus one j. And that's our third box. The third box is this: the expectation value of any correlation function is equal to just taking derivatives. This simple exponential, and after finishing the derivative, second j goes to I have all the number downstairs of this. 
So if the number is not even, I cannot fill the J's downstairs and I get zero when I put J close in. Okay, so it's also obvious in this formulation. Second common is what is the expectation and value of two of them, just I1, I2. This is the simplest object. This, by the way, I remind you, is the analog of the correlation x at position r, s at position r prime. Right? So this was exactly what we computed, the 2.5, the correlation between two spins. Well, to get just this simplest two-point function, I take two derivatives. The derivative can act on the first j or on the second j. They give the same thing, but cancel the factor of one half. And therefore, the result is a minus 1 element i1, i2. So not only it is the fundamental object that appears everywhere, but in its physical meaning, it's the two-point function of my fundamental fields. Okay, that's the meaning of the inverse, and the determinant is a free energy. And indeed, if you remember, these Gaussian fields, they were what? One way of understanding what these Gaussian fields was, was that this was nothing but the inverse of our matrix A, R, and R prime, right? That we had before. And what was this inverse? This inverse was just the inverse. One matrix we used a lot was this. U delta R I prime plus T sum over mu and plus minus delta R R prime plus minus E mu. Right? The, the neighbors. And we invert this matrix. And if you remember, inverting this matrix was also what we needed to do to compute the propagator in the random walk. Because we had said that there was an equation that the probability is satisfied of being in a point based on the neighbors. So this, inverting this matrix, was exactly like in the random walk recursion relation approach. And now we explain why this expectation value was equal to this random wall G of K and R. Right? Now we explain why it is the same. Because both are the inverse of a matrix. The reason why it was the inverse of a matrix in the random wall was based on the probability at step n plus 1. It's, uh, it's related to being somewhere in the neighbors and we wrote some recursion relation that involved inverting this matrix to get this G. And we saw this G is equal to the inverse of this matrix. Right? And now we see that this is nothing but the two-point function in the Gaussian model. Even simpler, if in the Gaussian model we had expectation value of say real part of spin momentum q with real part of spin momentum q prime, if you remember once we want to q and q prime the action was diagonal, it was just real part squared times something. So this is just delta function of q and q prime is diagonal times 1 over function, this is just a function, a q. The inverse is now just the inverse of this function a q. And this was nothing but 1 over u minus sum of t cosine of q mu. This was exactly what was also appearing in the random walks. I just want to, I'm just writing formulas to remind you of things you have seen. For example, we got this formula in the random walk approach by saying that we had this approach and the steps where we, at each step, so we 
we sum over, we are summing over steps, and at each step we add something like kappa, cosine of q mu, we sum, and we said that at each step there is some probability, some kappa, maybe some 1 over 2d, right? And we add integral e to the i q r, and this was the sum of probabilities. Each term in the expansion is the probability in k steps of moving by r, because this exponential projects into total distance there being r of n steps. But this, when I sum from zero steps to infinity, is exactly equal to 1 over some constant minus some constant sum over cosines, which is a cube, which is exactly the Just to, so again, it's a bit, a little bit. I'm just writing formulas for both models, but let me be super explicit. So what I want to say is that the expectation value well, now we see we don't need to compute but S R S R prime. If I have too many terms, 
some j's are left down, and when I put j to 0 at the end, I get 0. So the only term that I care is the one where I have 4 j's here. So 4 j's is when I get that 1 squared. So I get 1 over 2 factorial, 1 half, j i, a minus 1, a j, j j, that's one term, 1 half, jk, a minus 1, kl, jl, that's the other term. Right? That's fine, because again, that's one term in the expansion of the exponential, but higher power of j is dc0, because I don't have enough derivatives to kill the j's. Lower power of j is dc0, because I, take, I want to take four derivatives, so if I only have two j's, I get So all we need to do is take four derivatives of this expression, so you see what can happen is that the derivative with respect to i1, for example, can hit this j, this j, that j, or that j. Right? Do you agree? But this is symmetric. So whatever j this derivative acts gives the same thing. There's no j that is special. All are the same, right? The first time I act. So I'm going to do this computation slowly. So let's see. I can say that I1 is here. The derivative with respect to J1, I'm going to do this one first. Derivative with respect to J I1 is here. But it could be here as well, here as well, and here as well. Right? But they are all the same. Right? So I just put a factor of 4. Right? And then I say that it takes there. Right? Then this 4 basically will cancel. This 4 will cancel, say, this 2 and this 2, for example. And now I have ddi2. Now ddi2 can do two things. It can act here. Or there. But that's just the same, so factor of 2. Right? Because they are the same, the matrix A is symmetric, so like in there or there is the same. Or it can act here. D, D, J, I, 2. And this one is different, can be the factor 1. Right? And so, we conclude that the result, now I'm going to do it. Now you see that I'm going to do everything now. So if now I'll do just by words. If, if this is the first situation, so we have this or this. If it's this situation, here I already finished taking derivatives and I get a minus 1, i1, i2. And now 3 and 4 can act here, here, or here, here, but it's the same, just cancel the two. So one term that I get is, is equal to a minus 1 i1 i2 for this first case times a minus 1 i3 i4 because then the other 3 and 4 it's two options cancels the remaining two. The other option is 1 acts here and 2 acts here or here. Then the 2 was already cancelled and now 3 and 4 there are two different cases 3 acts here or 3 acts there. It's really two genuinely different cases. So I have to write two more terms, therefore. They are a minus 1, i1, i3, a minus 1, i2, i4, so a minus 1, i1, i4, a minus 1, i2, i3. Right? So we see that what happens is that we got this final result here. Can you put this like when you're doing the the AC model and you're like drawing some defense? Sorry, can you repeat? That it looks like when you're doing the IC model and like you get this interpretation in terms of like 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 lines between vertices. You get like similar things. So let's try to give some graphical interpretation to this. So let's notice a couple of things. So first thing that we notice, first before that, let's do a formula. 
that this is also the same as expectation value of i1 and i2 times expectation value of i3 i4 plus two other terms like this. Because a minus 1 is just a two-point function. So I can write the four-point function as a sum of product of two-point functions. Or as building blocks, as sum of products of a minus 1. Right? That's just because this, each element here is a two-point function. Okay, so this is the same thing. But let's find a graphic of another graphical interpretation. We can write this in the following way. We can say that I have I1, I2, I3, and I4. And in one term, I contract I1 and I2, and I3 and I4, that's the first term. But then the picture for the other one is obvious. 1 connects with 3, and then 2 connects with 4, and the other term, 1 connects with 4, and 2 connects with 3. That's just a graphical representation for the computation we just did. Right? This is just a picture. And we could also draw another nice graphical interpretation would be not to draw as four separate points, but to say that I have a cross where this is one, two, three, four, like the pointers of a clock. Right? It's just a picture. And I also choose to contract. So one contracts with two. 3 contracts with 4, plus 1 contracts with 3, 2 connects with 4, plus 1 connects with 4, 2 connects with 3. And these three graphs would be the angle with this, which would be the angle with that, which is that one. And in these kind of pictures, this is what we would normally call vacuum Feynman diagrams. They are just a graphical mnemonic for understanding how to think of this four-point function in this case. Where I draw my four-point function as a vertex with valence 4 and I just contract it in all possible ways. And that's what this Gaussian integral is. So finally, we can write our main result for today, which is Wick's theorem. Example, this could be 
1, 3, 2, 4. This could be 2n minus 1, 2n. This would be an example. But the picture is clear. I just sum over all possible pairs. One can couple with everyone else. One can couple with two, one with three, one with four, one with five. That's one's choice of pairs. And I have to sum over all possible choices of pairs. Of this object. Yeah. Where each individual element here is just the inverse of the Gaussian element, of the Gaussian matrix.
this diagram. Do you agree? Where I just connect this guy with this one, with this one, with this one, and all possible three options. Right? So there are three options. So I get this guy times three. Where what is this guy? This guy is just this propagator, this propagator. But each propagator is one, so this diagram is just one. I just do it to, rem to remember how it came about. There is a four vertex, and I can make like one with like two, like three with like four, but all legs are equivalent, so it's just a factor of three. Right? In other words, all these graphs, okay, they, they were here, they were this graph with different connection of legs, but they are all the same in this example. So, regardless, can we do it? We add that 1 can couple to 2, 3 can couple to 4, or 1 can couple to 4, 2 can couple to 3, or 1 can couple to 3, and 2 can couple to 4. Now this diagram... Is the first two are in like just the same? Like, like so, if this matrix, if this I1, I2, I3, I4 are different indices. And if I have a general problem, these three graphs are three different things. But now we are doing a case where we are just dealing with a single variable. Right? So there's no indices. Right? So. Okay, so like this is just X and X. Doesn't matter who I contract with, they're all the same. Yeah. And X squared is 1. So we call this building block, we call it the propagator. And it's a propagator, it's a matrix that depends on two indices. But in this toy example, the propagator is just x with x, there's no index. And expectation value of x squared is what? It's the inverse of the matrix. But it's normalized correctly right now because I just have x squared over 2, so it's the inverse of 1. Right? It's x squared over 2. It's function here is just one half of x times number one times x, so it's nicely normalized, the inverse is one. So this propagator is just one. It's one over one. And therefore each propagator here is one, so all diagrams give one, because they are normalized and the propagator is one. So just about counting. How many ways are there of contracting? And there are two n minus one double factor. Now when we bring this down we start computing and we see 1 plus lambda times 3 graphs, which were the 3 terms in the 4 point function that we had before, and all of them give 1, because they are expectation value of x squared, this propagator, which gives 1, and this propagator that gives 1. But these 3 are this plus this plus this. But each graph gives 1, so just 3 times this graph. I continue expanding and I get lambda square over 2 times the expectation value of x to the 8 and here again these are just pictures what matters is that this bracket here is the number 3 Pictures are not important, the pictures are in our mind, right? We are drawing pictures to have some graphical interpretation. The pictures will become more physical when we learn more complicated Gaussian models. But for now, it is just a, a tool for keeping track of these numbers. The three there as an interpretation are the three ways of contracting the, the vertices. Now we have expectation value of x to the 8 because we bring down that vertex twice, right? And I can also think of this x to the 8 as x to the 4 times x to the 4. It's up to me. It's really up to me. So it's the same thing. But let's see what pictures we will generate. If we think of x to the 4, of x to the 8 and x to the 8 picture, what do I have? I have a vertex that has 8 edges. They are all equivalent, all these edges are equivalent, there's no specific ordering, so I just contract them, contract them, contract them, and contract them. This propagator, each propagator.
propagator is one, so this graph gives one. Right? And how many ways are there? Well, I just plug n equals 4 in this formula here. So I get 7 double factorial. So this times the number. 7, no, 7, is it 7? So n equal 4. Yeah, I did some mistakes, sorry. My n is 2. My n is 3. Ah, I don't get 3. Okay, yeah, it's correct. And 7 times 5 times 3 times 1. That's the number of ways that there are of choosing food do I contract in the first time, food do I contract in the second, food do I contract in the third, food do I contract in the fourth. But this was just a number we already computed. I'm doing nothing new. I'm just saying that I like to think of that number as multiplied by this graph, which gives one. Do you agree? Yeah? So again, I'm just expanding this in lambda, and I get the infinity diagram, and then I get this other complicated vacuum diagram that comes with this number. How much is this number? It's 95, right? No, 105. How much is this? 7 times 5, 35, 105. Eight is just a particular case of 20. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do. 
to eight. There are 105 ways of connecting them. Each way is one.
building, like the, the expansion, you tell us something about like that divergence? We are doing perturbation theory, so we are assuming lambda to be very small and we are bringing it down and, do, and computing it as powers of lambda. For now, let's think lambda is negative so that it converge. But I'll comment a little bit more about it, but well, let's just continue computing this equation. Um, so now, do these numbers add up to 105, this other way of computing, or did I forget the line? Just having one line connecting to the two axes. That cannot be because then uh, I cannot. Oh, okay. Ah, here I this was wrong. This ID was wrong. Right? So, this ID was wrong because I said first there are three options to choose how to close. By doing that, I'm assuming that this leg is forming the loop. But this leg could also join them. So first, I have to choose which legs here are going to close. Right? So that is a binomial of out of the four, I choose two, who are going to close here. I do the same thing here, so there is a square. And then there are only two remaining ones, and there is a factor of two after that. So this is four times three squares, so this is four times three square times that's how many ways there are and now this should add up to 105 okay so we add them all up and this gives 105 times that where one is in each diagram here in this picture they all get So from the point of view of combinatorics, 
this split into x4, x4 anticipates what would happen if this x would have an index. Because then when you bring it down, you are bringing down a vertex that integrates over space time or over momenta and another one or another momentum. So then in that case, this propagator is a propagator from one point in space time to the same, and this is a propagator from one point in space time to another point in space time, and you want to distinguish two types of propagators. Now there's no space time, there's one degree of freedom, there's no space, there's no time, and it's all the same. Propagators between x to x or x to another x is the same. But from the point of view of combinatorics, this would be the graphs that we will do for quantum field theory. I just want to point out that these graphs I could write this, I could say that this is exponential of minus f and now let's, let's write what f is so f has no constant when lambda is 0 I want to get 1 so f starts at 0 and then f starts f is minus 3 lambda times this graph right? then when I expand minus times of minus and I get 3 do you agree? and now what do I get? now you see that I want to get these graphs here so I write plus lambda square over 2 or minus lambda square over 2 and I'm going to write it down there is 24 times this graph here plus 72 times this graph here you read? but you see that the other one I don't want to write because the other one comes with coefficient 3 square over 2 that I generate from expanding this term here if I already expand this term here in the exponential down the term which is d square over 2 already contains this term here so my expression is done I'm finished it's this plus order lambda cube So what happened here? For the for the for my partition function and my free energy. What happens that my partition function was the sum of all vacuum diagrams. And what's my free energy?
And it's easy to see that it does, so let's do it by hand. So it comes from expanding on the tube, so it comes as the factorial downstairs. Right? And then how many options there are? There are three times three times three options. So it's 27 over 3 factorial. Oops. I need an extra two. So this lambda cube comes from expanding these three times. So there is lambda cube over 3 factorial and then each of those bubbles gives a factor of 3 because of what we said before so 3 cubed is 27 
expand down, and now it's expectation values in the Gaussian model, some polynomial downstairs. And then I compute those averages using this theorem, and that is the old idea of time maps. It's a way of treating the formations around Gaussian model as small perturbations that I bring down and compute the averages. So we are going to start doing that uh, next time and uh, seeing how uh, Simon Duff perturbation theory comes about in the Gaussian model and how we make one last contact with the random logs uh, uh, when we do it uh, in that way. Okay. Well, it's a good time to stop, I guess. Yeah, it's one o'clock. Okay, let's start.